Is it too cold in here? Okay, yeah. Hey, um, who's near the door? Are Sarah and Chelsea in here? Can you just tell Tracy to t- tell him to get it? Uh, is it, I'm really cold, so is it really cold or just up a couple degrees or what, where are we at? Really cold? It's just kind of cold, yeah. So Chelsea, maybe up two, three degrees, thanks. We're on time, so I'll try to keep us on time. Um, so my topic that I gave myself is hip arthroplasty for acetabular fractures. And this is primarily, if you're going to do a hip arthroplasty for an acetabular fracture, it's primarily in the elderly patient. And there are some indications. And uh, so I kind of want to march through that. So the principal indications for acute total hip in an acetabular fracture are severe intraarticular comminution. 10 or more fragments, particularly in the weight-bearing dome. Full thickness cartilage loss. Femoral head impaction. An acetabular impaction, either of the dome or marginally impacted posterior wall, greater than 40%. So basically, you know, an elderly patient has got a multifragmentary, just destroyed acetabulum. And you look at it and you say, I don't think I could reconstruct that. Additional indications, which are traditional indications for hip arthroplasty in the acute setting, are pre-existing severe DJD. They come in, they got an arthritic hip, and then they bust their acetabulum. So again, standard uh, radiographic signs. Subchondral cirrhosis, subchondral cysts, joint space narrowing osteophytes, lateralization of the femoral head of a big medial osteophyte pushing it out. Classic signs uh, radiographically. If you've got an ipsilateral acetabular fracture and a displaced femoral head or femoral neck fracture, much higher risk of complications, post-traumatic OA and AVN. You may just want to move to hip arthroplasty acutely. Or if they just have significant osteopenia and you get in there and you know it's going to be a struggle to get a good reduction, get a good result and good fixation. And most elderly patients, I don't know about your patients, my patients don't listen to anything I tell them. They like me and I like them, but... They're going to do what they want, particularly if I tell them they can't walk on it for 12 weeks. Even if they're well-meaning and they want to not walk on it, they're just going to have a mishap. And that, that's where we run into trouble with the displaced acetabular fracture. Mears looked at this, and in 02, he showed that with acute hip arthroplasty for acute uh, acetabular fractures in the elderly patient, he had fairly reasonable hair hip scores, and what he described as nearly 80% good results. Now, there's been some uh, debate regarding this study and, um, and, and the results. I'll just leave it at that. He's been challenged significantly, but this is the one major publication out there regarding this. And in his series, he had six cases of HO. All his cups subsided a bit, and I've had the same experience, but they subside typically in a stable position as the fracture heals, and they don't change position. And there were no late cup or stem loosening. That's a good thing. So I think that's a good out for an acetabular fracture and someone who's going to likely displace it, get post-traumatic OA, get problems, and need a hip arthroplasty anyway. One operation instead of two. And they like that too, that idea. He had no deaths, no infections, no sciatic nerve injuries in his series, no pulmonary emboli. Those are the big ones I'm a little worried about. He had some dislocations, 4%, late dislocations but no symptomatic or radiographic loosening, no late infections. So he concluded that there are selected indications for acute hip arthroplasty in, with acetabular fractures, and they're the ones you look at and say, I think I can't fix this. I think they're going to do poorly for one reason or another. It's too bad of a fracture. They're not going to listen to what I'm going to say. Morbidly obese, a little bit of dementia, on a lot of meds. One operation, get them up and going. Here's the problem. If you go in there and there's a chance you think you're going to fix it and you're out to hip arthroplasty or sometimes you have to stabilize a part of the acetabulum before you do the hip arthroplasty, most surgeons fall into the category of they fix acetabular fractures a lot and well or they do hip arthroplasty, but it's not a lot of surgeons that do both. And so it's nice to have a surgeon in there or refer to someone in the community who does hip arthroplasty frequently and fixes acetabular fractures, both. Otherwise, you've got to have two attendings in there, your joint guy and your fracture guy, or have them on standby. 
Let's look at a few cases. So here's a patient with a common root, both column mastitabular fracture. On this view, it doesn't look too bad. You say, well, the femoral head's congruent with the dome segment. A little bit of petruzio, gold wing sign here. It's pushed in a bit. There's definitely a fracture through the, the anterior column on this view. On the iliac oblique view, it's a fracture through the posterior column. Juxtatectal, but not transtectal. Still doesn't look too bad. Patient's uh, not very sick, not very obese. You could think, I could fix this, perhaps, on these views. They get the CT scan, and you see the dome displacement. There's a little bit of comminution, not extreme. CT scan. The 3DC kind of shows it a little bit better, but you see, you know, there is actually quite a bit of comminution and buckling, fairly parodic. But a reasonable dome fragment, sorry, here. So this one's it's right on the fence for me. This is one where I say, I think I can fix this, but it's going to be a long operation, probably through an ilia inguinal approach. I may not be able to get the posterior component very well um, to this approach. Very parodic and comminuted. I tell them, you may get arthritis. You may have problems. The patient helped me decide to do the hip replacement in this situation. This one's kind of on the fence. I went in and did the hip replacement. They wanted to get up, get moving. And so that was the answer. But if you look at this amount of comminution in an elderly parotic patient, you know, it's worrisome. And I fixed a lot of these. I've gone both ways, and, and I just know that in my hands, I'm going to struggle all day on that to get that just perfect. I'm going to torture myself and everybody around me in the operating room to get that just right and then still not have it where I want it, likely. It's just too comminuted and parotic, and it's likely going to go on to OA. So here's the out. Press fit, multi-hole cup, reverse ream, allograft, croutons, cancellous bone into all those interstices. You use four to six bags, it just kind of fills it all up. You can expand a press fit even to those fracture fragments. A bigger couple kind of push them to the point where it actually fits pretty well. Now they have to stay non-weight bearing for 12 weeks. You can't let them just walk, but I think this is a reasonable approach. Case two, this one's worse. You see the gold wing sign, they've got marginal impaction here. That's that impacted dome fragment, Petruzio, elderly parotic bone. A little bit demented, obese, two-back-a-day smoker, unfiltered, camels, on prednisone. Should I go on? Yeah, right, so I don't want to do a bunch of operations on this patient. You see they're pushed in medially, they're parotic as could be. Bad news, extreme. When you see this impacted dome, marginally impacted posteriorly, impacted anterior fragments, I mean, good luck. I guess it's reducible in, in some people's hands, um, some surgeons' hands, and I know uh, plenty of surgeons, I gave this talk in Toronto at the pelvic nastabry course, and I had plenty of surgeons say, boy, I'd fix all those fractures that you did hip replacements on. Maybe you feel really bad, like, man, why can't I fix those? But I guess you could if you struggled and struggled and struggled, but how's the patient gonna do? Will they stay reduced? Will they get arthritis? Yes, 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 they're gonna get arthritis. Look at this, it's the same case, common. So if I get in there and I can't get a good press fit, then I, my out is the roof ring. Cemented all poly cup inside a roof ring with multiple screws. And then don't let them walk on a tell at hills. And this works, this works time in and time out. And it's one operation, by the way, this ORAF operation in a common patient that's elderly, that's obese, I'm going to be in there all day, and they're going to have big anesthesia, a lot of blood loss, going to go to the ICU for a long time. You can get in and out on a hip replacement in an hour, hour and a half. It's a little better for the patient. And there's that roof ring construct. You can get a nice flange up on the iliac wing, a flange down on the ischial tuberosity, some good screws in there, and a cemented all poly cup. Will you give me the warning for sure when I don't want to run late? Give me the, uh, the light when I have like two minutes, two, three minutes. Yeah, thanks. Posterior column and posterior wall. Elderly, just dusted their posterior wall. I just stopped, count, stopped counting fragments. I get too depressed trying to count them all. Are you kidding me? I suppose you could try to fix it. I have tried to fix these. It's not a positive experience. I was doing this, uh, going through my slides last night at the kitchen table late. I have eight-year-old triplets, and I uh, pulled Lukey over first and said, what do you see? 
He said, that looks like a baseball dad. Get out of here, kid. Sophie, what do you see? She said, how'd they make that arrow yellow? But Jack, Jack's my thinker. Jack looked at it and he said, how are you going to fix that? It seems like it'd be really hard to fix. Right, right, Jack. And that's the deal. So I went ahead and um, planned for hip arthroplasty, but sometimes when you don't have any wall back there, you've got to do some fixation. And these little threader wires, these are not K wires, they're, they're the threaded guide wires off the Foro Canyon. They're like mini screws. I don't think you should put K wires back in here, but if you've got a little thread on the end, it'll stay where you put it, it won't migrate. It's a good, good way to put the little fragments in. But it's not gonna do well until I also do the hip arthroplasty. But I fixed the column on the wall to give me some stability to put the cup into. Femoral head, auto graft back here with big screws to supplement it, then a roof ring and an all poly cup. All right, so that's, I think, the way to go on a lot of these elderly patients that you don't think you're going to get a good result trying to fix it. Give them a new hip. The toughest part still on the new hip is they still want to walk on it right away. It feels good right away to them. And they say, you know, doctor, I know my body far better than you do. And how old are you? They always remind me. And how old are you? When were you born? So they're just telling you, basically, they know more than you about their own body, and they're pain-free, which means they're going to walk, and they're not going to follow your instructions. So I keep trying to just tell them, you know, this will likely displace. Please don't. Your cut might go vertical. Please stay off it. you got to just keep coaching them on that. And then I just want to spend the rest of the talk talking a bit on, if you go ahead and fix it, and they come in, and they got arthritis, how do you deal with that? I mean, is it just doing a hip replacement just the same if you're doing a rheumatoid and a, an osteoporotic patient versus acetabular fracture, and how does it change your operation if they've already had surgery on their acetabulum? They got plates and screws and heterotopic bone and previous scars. It changes it a lot. And I want to just touch on that briefly. Rogan looked at this. He said, if you do a hip replacement on someone who's got a previous acetabular fracture, particularly if they've had surgery, you've got problems. Compared to the general patient who's had a standard hip, you're getting higher dislocations, more component loosening, more HO. You've got to deal with the sciatic nerve, and there's more sciatic nerve injuries when you try to go in there. There's a better chance you're going to hurt the sciatic nerve and a higher infection rate. All the bad complications go up if they had a previous acetabular fracture. Romnus looked at this as well. He had a 40% um, intermediate loosening of the cup, where 5% is the average. And the femoral loosening is fine. It's the acetabulum that loosens. So something changes when they heal an acetabular fracture and you go in and ream into that bone. That bone isn't the same as far as ingrowth into the cup or getting in the right position of the cup or fixation of the cup. Something happens. The cup loosens early. So when should we go in and do this? Well, if you have failure of internal fixation, subluxation, dislocation, if they have symptomatic post-traumatic arthritis, they've got AVN of the femoral head. These are the classic indications for hip replacement anyway. You see it a lot after acetabular fracture. And I want to show you a few cases. Here's an older person who has an ipsilateral uh, proximal femur fracture and a comminuted posterior wall and column acetabular fracture. This is bad news. Look at all the comminution back here. I'm doing fine. I come in, make rounds, and the residents start pulling up the CT scans, and that's when I just start getting that neck and chest pain and looking at these thinking, oh, man, I'm going to be in here all day. But I love it. I do love it. Look at all the comminution up in here. Well, I went ahead and decided to fix this. I think I got a reasonable reduction, a congruent hip. There's a place through the posterior coca Langeback approach. I fixed uh, the proximal femur with a DHS. This is back in my DHS days. This is probably in the late 90s. But that posterior wall, if it didn't look like it was going to heal when you first saw it, because you probably thought those fragments are fairly avascular, or I maybe had to divitalize them a little, taking the soft tissues off so I could see them to put them together. You're right. It just melted away. It just, the whole posterior wall dissolved, basically. So the posterior wall is just sitting out here now. Femoral heads eroded away. So we go in and do bulk femoral head with allograft, um, and I use that to rebuild a posterior wall. And then whenever there's previous surgery on the femoral side, have a sebatome or some burr ready. If you just ream broach that, it typically is going to break up on you. It's fairly ebernated bone. It's best just to burr that out.
not going in with a reamer and just spinning those fragments. Another quick case, this is an elderly obese patient. Um, again, the obesity matters intraoperatively. I have a picture that I just took out of here. I threw it out just to keep the talk smaller, but one of the residents, I was taking pictures intraoperatively and I, having them retract and someone was holding this and he'd written across his chest um, that he wanted us also photo, kill me please, with the marker after multiple hours of surgery on this patient or hard cases. Comminuted transtectal fracture. We got a good reduction, but it went on to kind of sublux dislocate and arthritis. And then again, the out is a hip arthroplasty. And there it is. Technical considerations. So my time's up in one minute. I'm going to finish up here on technical considerations. So you got to think about what's the previous exposure? Where's the scar? Where's the bone? Is there HO? Almost every time. Where's the metal? Where's the nerve? The sciatic nerve typically isn't exactly where it was the first time in. It could be scarred up higher right on that quadratus. And the nerve doesn't look like the nerve anymore. It's all sclopped in the scar. It's hard to find. That's why there's such a higher risk of nerve injury. Bone deficiency, non-union, HO. What do you do to sort this out? Get a CT scan. This patient who walked in my office was treated elsewhere with a bad hip. I don't know where the metal is. You ought to get a CT scan. Look at all the HO there. There's metal actually in the joint. It's all got to be contended with. Cebatone burr here, press fit cup. Get whatever metal out you can. Have a Midas Rex in the room. Don't go after and take the plate out, but if you run into a screw with your reamer, just amputate it with a Midas Rex and entomb the metal. If you go after that posterior plate, think you have to get it out, you're going to end up bagging the nerve. And then finally, bone defects. If you've got a segmental defect that's uncontained, Femoral head allograft or distal femur allograft works well. Ream into that. Here's an example of that where this patient did well. They've got an anatomic reduction. Look at this fracture. It's a, it's a bad news fracture, comminuted. I think I got a nice reduction, but it went on to OA head wear. And so you can see here, I'll just go back to this. Uh, femoral head allograft to contain that cup. And a final case, if you have defects that are contained, not uncontained, but contained, you can just reverse ream that allograft and then press fit your cup in. And um, here's an example of that roof ring, cemented all poly cup. It's a beautiful out. When you're in there and reaming, you just can't get your press fit. You can just have them pull up the roof ring, cement in the all poly cup, and I think it's a really good way to go. I think I'm going to end there so that we can get on to Dennis's uh, uh, lecture, but in conclusion, there are clear indications for hip replacement in the acute setting. And there's plenty of surgeons, that will, uh, my colleagues, that will attempt to fix these and say that's the way to go. But I would, my bias is, and I would argue that these patients want one operation, hip replacement, get them moving, particularly if you think they're going to get osteoarthritis anyway. And if they come in with arthritis after previous surgery, please be aware of HO, metal, the risk to the nerve, and that you got to tell your patient, no matter what you do, the hip replacement isn't going to be just like their neighbor's hip replacement that didn't have a previous surgery. There's a higher loosening rate and a higher complication rate, no matter what, in everybody's hands. Thank you.